Well, we're in Mark chapter 11, verse 23. The title of today's message is, Speak to that mountain. Say that with me this morning. Say, Speak, Speak to that mountain. that mountain. In Mark chapter 11, verse 23, the word of the Lord, Jesus said these words, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, what mountain, whatever mountain is in front of you, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatever, whatsoever he saith. Now I want you to see this morning in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, that he's talking about mountains. Now what is a mountain? As we know, a mountain is something that stands before you that is huge and wide and insurmountable. It are, they are barriers. They are boundaries. Most of you ever looked at a United States map and you ever wondered why everything is so jagged and everything is so, uh, you know, just dis oblong and out of shape? Why didn't somebody just take the states and make them all square and make them all asymmetrical? You ever wonder that? Well, the reason is, obviously, and everybody knows, is because of boundaries, because of rivers, because of mountains, because of uh, God-made boundaries. Amen. And states were formed that way. For example, the, what divides us between North Carolina and Tennessee is a mountain right out here. Once you've got to cross that mountain to get in, or you go all the way to Johnson City to go around that mountain. But mountains are things in our lives that are barriers. Now, not every mountain is a physical mountain, although some are. Some mountains are spiritual. Those spiritual mountains are things that are holding you back from everything that God has for you, holding you back from your destiny. A mountain can be sickness and disease. A mountain can be debt. A mountain can be depression and oppression. A mountain can be oppressive people. A mountain can be whatever it is. It can be your taxes. It can, it can be uh, your neighbors. A mountain is anything and everything that is holding you back or is, is a boundary between you and what God has for you and wants for you. Notice Jesus didn't say to, to climb that mountain. He didn't say to camp on that mountain. He didn't say to hike that mountain or go around it. What did he say to do to that mountain? He said to speak to that mountain. And I want you to see right there in Mark chapter 11 verse 23 that Jesus said the word say three times. For verily I say unto you Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, there's one, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So three times right there, Jesus uses the word say. What is he trying to communicate to us? He's trying to communicate that we need to speak. Everybody say speak. Say. To the mountains that are before us. Again, he does. he's not telling us to climb them. He's not telling us to, to hike them. He's not telling us to go around them. He's, telling, he's not telling us certainly to camp in them, although those are things that we all do. He's telling us to speak to that mountain and it will be removed. So speaking is very, very powerful if you're going to move the mountains in your life. Many times people are wearing themselves out trying to climb a mountain that we cannot climb. They're wearing themselves out trying to go around that mountain. Wearing themselves out, trying to wonder why that mountain's there, where did it come from, and what did I do to get it in my life? It doesn't matter. If a mountain shows up in your life, we are the, uh, commanded by Jesus Christ to speak to that mountain and believe in faith that it shall move. If you believe that this morning, say amen. amen. Come on and put your hands together and make a high Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible tells us about some weapons of our warfare that God has given us. For the Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. What does that mean? To the pulling down of strongholds. There are some weapons that God has given us. Verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole, everybody say the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So there is armor that God has given us. <coughs> armor, defense. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What does that mean? Well, that means that we don't fight against flesh and blood. We are supposed to love flesh and blood. Well, even what about our enemies, Pastor? Well, you're supposed to love them even more. That's what Jesus said. Don't just love them. Go above and beyond to love them. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not your spouse, it's not your brother, it's not your parents, it's not your boss, it's not your neighbors, it's not, it's not 
flesh and blood. Our fight is against spirits that are operating within those people. Amen. Within those circumstances. Devils that don't like you. Demons that have been assigned to you and they use human beings to, to bring their, their purpose and their plan to pass because that's the only way they can find expression upon the earth. Not saying that everybody that's against you is possessed. Most of them aren't. 99.9% .9 of them are not. But every one of us can be honest and, and, and remember a time in our life where we were in the flesh a little more than we were in the spirit and the enemy used that as an opportunity to influence us to maybe make somebody else's life a little harder than it should have been until all of a sudden the Holy Ghost talked to us, showed us what we were doing. We repented and we repented of that person and love prevailed. Amen? Amen. This, is while the, this is how the enemy works. It, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is not human beings. Our enemy is the devil who is influencing those individuals. So the Bible tells us that uh, well, here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take up the whole armor of God that we can stand in the evil day. And here's what it says. To withstand an evil day and having done all to stand, stand. Verse 14. Number, verse 13 and verse 14 says stand twice. I want you to understand this morning. Hallelujah, that the battle does not belong to you. It's a battle you can't fight, just like that's a mountain you can't climb. The battle does not belong to us. The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. For the Bible tells us to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What does the word of the Lord tell us? It says that it set your face like flint against the wind. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. But understand that God will fight your battles. You are surrounded, but God is surrounding you. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, you can fight that battle on your own. And the Holy Ghost is a gentleman and he'll let you. He'll let you do it. He'll let you fight that battle. He'll say, okay, when you're ready and you're ready to tag out, I'll come in. But if we're smart, we'll let God fight that battle right from the start. How many of you in here this last week have been fighting the devil? Ooh, you ain't been with me too long, amen. Some of my veterans here. <laughs> you know better to raise your hand on that. Why are you fighting a an, an enemy that has already been defeated? Satan has been defeated at the cross of Calvary. Can I get an amen? amen. Then nowhere in the scripture does the Bible tell us to fight the devil. He's defeated. Amen. amen. We are supposed to fight the good fight of faith. That's what you meant. I know that's what you meant. We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? How do we do that? What is Who is that fight against? That fight is not against the devil. He's whooped and defeated and made a nice little customized footstool for me, according to the Word of God. But that fight is against me and my ability to stand in the midst of it and confess God's Word and praise Him in the midst of circumstances and situations that look contrary. My ability to overcome doubt, to overcome unbelief, to overcome uh, fear. That is what, that's the fight. The fight is against me and my doubt and my unbelief and, and everything that I, my flesh struggles with. Can I get an amen? My purpose is to believe God, to trust Him, to watch Him fight and fight my battles, to not look to the right, to not look to the left, but set my face like flint against the wind and watch the Lord move mightily in my life and you too. Come on and put your hands together and give us a praise for the warrior King Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. Yeah. Worthy to be praised. Say this with me this morning. Say, He will fight. He, will fight. he, is, fighting. he is fighting. All my battles, All my they belong to the Lord. Belong. I will not waste an ounce of energy Amen. fighting a foe that's already been defeated. Hey, Ben, I will not waste an ounce of energy. I'm going to praise the one who won the battle for me. Hallelujah. So we need to stand. When you've done all that you can do to stand, but pastor, I can't stand anymore. The Word of God says stand. When you've done everything you can to stand, that's all we need to do is stand still. Yes. Stand still. Stand, stand still. I want you to see in a moment here that all of this armor that God has given us, none of it has anything to do with our backside. Have you noticed that? None of this armor has anything to do with our backside. Because we are supposed to stand and not stand this way against our enemy, but stand firm and face our enemy. Yes. Face our enemy. God, that's all He tells us to do is show up. You stand there and you watch me. I, many years ago, I, I did a sermon illustration and I wish I would have thought about it for today, but it must not have been meant to be. And there's this little baby bear cub and he's off playing in, in the wilderness. And his mama, he wanders away from his mama, you know, and he's playing in the water and he's going off on his own. And all of a sudden, this mountain lion, this cougar comes up on him and, and says, mmm, there's some dinner, amen, dinner. And he starts looking at a little bear cub and chasing it and following it and stalking it. 
And all of a sudden, a bear cub uh, turns around and, and there's that cougar right there, right in front of him, ready to pounce on him. And the cougar even slaps him in the snoot. And there's, uh, there's blood on his mouth. And the little bear cub, he's like at the, his wit's end, so he don't know anything better. So he starts to, you know, thinking that's going to that's gonna, uh, chase the, the cougar off. And all of a sudden, the cougar's ears go back and his eyes get real big. And he starts to back up. And all we see is the little bear cub. The little bear cub's thinking, this is working. <laughs> but then the video pans on. This was a true nature video. Somebody caught this, thank God, on, on camera. I don't think they staged it. I don't think they would cooperate. But in the, in, in the background, they, they pan the camera up. And right behind that little baby bear is Mama. And she's growling. As the baby's growling. She's rrr. See, that's a good illustration of how we fight our battles. God says, you show up. You face the enemy. Yeah. Face to face. Prosukamai. One on one. You stand still and I will back you up. And all power, all authority, all dominion comes from me who are behind you. And I will fight your battles for you. Hallelujah. Come on and pray. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and thank the Lord. For the Bible says in the book of Psalms chapter 23 that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh -huh. That's how God likes to work. Those that are enemies of yours, the, the devil and the forces of darkness, they will have to watch you eat. They'll have to watch you take that victory lap. Amen? Amen. They'll have to watch you go through that. So when your enemies start, you ever felt like you were surrounded? When enemies start popping up, sickness, all of a sudden... Financial pressures, maybe even people, whatever it is. When those enemies start popping up little by one, say, I thought you'd never get here. What took you so long? You know why? Because when they start popping up, all of a sudden, keep your eyes open because the table's going to show up. When your enemy starts showing up in your life in abundance and you feel surrounded, start rejoicing because he says he will put, put, put a table, put a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. So when the enemy starts showing up in abundance and you're surrounded by death, you're surrounded by affliction. You're surrounded by sickness and that that's everything's trying to come upon you. And even situations in your life, start praising and rejoicing because pretty soon you better get washed up because it's going to be time to eat your dinner. Hallelujah. Because he, he sets a table before me in the presence of my enemy. If you believe that this morning, come on and put your hands together and give the Lord a rousing applause of victory. Amen. So we understand that we're supposed to stand having our loins girt about with the belt of truth. We're supposed to have our belt of truth on. Yeah. And having the breastplate of righteousness on. And our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16. Above all, taking up the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. So we are supposed to take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. One thing I want you to see about every bit of that artillery, every bit of that armor is this. Only one of it is actually artillery. Only one of it is, is of that, those pieces of armor is offensive. Every other piece of armor is defensive. Helmet, belt, feet shot, your boots, Breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith. But there's one that is offensive, offensive, an offensive weapon. And that is the sword of the Spirit. Now you might say, but pastor, you just contradicted yourself. You said that we're going to go into battle and God will fight my battles for me. That I'm not surrounded by the enemy, I'm surrounded by him. Well, why do I need a sword? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you a little something about that sword. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this. For the word of God is living. Everybody say it's alive. And active. Yeah. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. What is the Word of God? Well, the Bible says that the Word of God is the Bible. Hold up your Bibles if you carry them to church. Many of you hold up your cell phones and your iPads and all that. That's your, I know, you're bringing them in that way. That's your Word right there. That's your sword. That's your sword. That's not some dead book of poems and history. Honey, that is the living, breathing Word of God right there. And the Bible says in the book of John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word through Him all things were made and that Word became flesh to dwell amongst us. Hallelujah. That Word created all things. That Word delivers me. That Word heals me. That Word sets me free. That Word saves me. That Word baptizes me in the 
Holy Ghost. That word comforts me. That word is my sword. That word is my sword. That word is my strength. That word is my shield. Hallelujah. That word of the Lord is my strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. And I'm looking at the righteous of God here this morning in this place. Thank God for the word. Thank God for his sword. Thank God for the weapons of our warfare that they are not carnal. They, they are not carnal. They are not physical, but they are mighty to the pulling down the strongholds. If you believe that this morning, give the Lord some praise. Give the Lord some praise. Give the Lord some amen. Hallelujah. So that word right there, that sword, it was the word of God. And it's active. And it's living. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's even sharper than any sword known to mankind. Piercing to the division of soul and spirits of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the hearts. What does that mean? Sometimes it hurts. If you're not living right and some preacher puts that word out of his mouth, or you hear it on the radio, or you read it yourself, it's going to prick you, isn't it? Yeah. And it's designed to. Like a surgeon's scalpel is designed to cut out cancer, cut out disease. The Word of God is designed to cut out spiritual cancer in our lives, spiritual disease in our lives. It's designed to shape us. It's designed to mold us. Hallelujah. But if you're living right and everything's good between you and the Lord, it's the other edge of that sword is not against you. The other edge of that sword is against your enemies. Amen. Your enemies, not flesh and blood, remember. But the spirits of darkness, many times, that are binding up that flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. so that's a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's living, it's alive, it's powerful. How does it work, Pastor? Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11 tells us how it works. For as the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth, makes it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word, this is God speaking, what is His word? The sword of the Spirit, right? What is His word? The Bible. What is His word? Jesus became flesh. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. When the devil tempted Jesus in the, in the, in the, in the wilderness, when He was fasting and praying, He said, you're hungry, eat. If you're the Son of God, turn these rocks into bread. Jesus quoted scripture and he says it is written Satan man shall not live by bread alone but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God amen this word that is we call the Bible came from the mouth of God years ago and the Bible says that it was caught by holy men who were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and they penned it and we have the Bible because of that today this holy word the word became flesh for as the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and does not return there until it does its job, it will return there. Rain and snow eventually evaporate. Remember the rain cycle? We learned about it from watching public broadcasting cartoons. What do you have first? Well, you have evaporation, condensa condensation, mixes together up there in them clouds. We're getting a lot of it lately. And then precipitation. It goes in a cycle. The rain that comes from heaven, the snow that comes from heaven, the moisture that comes from heaven has an assignment. Yes, it does. And God says in His Word in Isaiah 55, as surely as the rain that comes from heaven has a specific assignment, so does my Word. So does my Word. It has a purpose. It has an assignment. So shall my Word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the things which I have sent it. This is what the Lord says right there. So God's Word is quick, it's powerful, it's a sword, and it has an assignment. Amen. Well, what does that have to do with me, Pastor? Blah, 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 blah. I'm glad you mentioned. I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Job chapter 22, verses 22 through 28. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. So in other words, this, the Scripture is saying, Receive the law, which is the Word of God, from God's mouth and lay it up in your heart. Why is it so important to lay God's Word up in our heart? Because the Bible says that out of, a man's, out of the abundance of a man's uh, heart, his mouth shall speak. So the next time you're going through a calamity, the next time you're going through a situation, you can always tell what's in your heart. Because if, if, if your heart is full of the wrong things, cursing will come out of your heart, your mouth. 
Wrong things will come out of your heart, your mouth. Negativity will come out of your heart, your mouth, because it's in your heart. But when you, that's why it's important to put God's word in our heart, to meditate on it, to put it in there night and day. So that the next time you're in a situation, and instead of saying, oh God, what am I going to do to pay this bill? Oh God, the doctor said i got to die. Oh God, I, these kids are unruly. That won't come out of your mouth. What will come out of your mouth if the doctor looks at you and says, you've got cancer, you've got to die. You can say, hey, hey, I appreciate your opinion, doctor. Do everything you can to help me because God blessed you with that, with that gift. But I'm here to tell you that that my Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. My Bible says I shall live and I shall not die. My Bible says that I'm the head and I'm not the tail. I don't care what the accountant says. You can say I got to file chapter 13 or whatever, chapter 11. I always get those two mixed up, the trash can or the or bankruptcy. It doesn't matter. Listen, you can say what you're going to say, Mr. CPA. I appreciate your advice, but I'm here to tell you, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, my Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm blessed going in and blessed coming out. Everything I set my hand to shall prosper. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Praise his holy name. You know what that is? You put the Word of God in your heart and there's more of God's Word in your heart than there are the ways of the world. That's right. Because how a man thinketh, his mouth shall speak. Now that the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth shall speak. How a man thinketh, he becomes. It's like the twelve that came back, that the spies that were spying out the promised land. Two of them came back and said, we can do it. We can do this. If God is for us, we can take this land. They were Joshua and Caleb. The other ten came back and said, we can't do it, man. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Those giants are huge if you've seen them. They're too big. We can't do it. How many of you know how a man thinketh in his heart? So it, how, a, how a man thinketh, so he is. The, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. Those ten that came back, they thought of themselves as grasshoppers. But the two came back, thought of them, understood who their God was. And said, we shall do great and mighty exploits under the hand of our Lord. How are you thinking about yourself? How are you thinking about your circumstances? How are you thinking about your situation? The only thing that's going to change your mind and change the way you think is putting the word of God in your mind, in your, in your spirit and eating it and putting it in your belly so that when the day of calamity comes naturally up out of your mouth it will come. Hallelujah. Come on and praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay it up his words in your heart. Verse 23. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up and thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Okay, so put God's word in your heart and get right. Get the sin out of your life. Verse 24. Then shalt, shalt thou lay up gold as dust and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. In other words, you'll be blessed. Verse 25. Yea, the Almighty shall be your defense, and you shall have plenty of silver. You'll be blessed. Yeah. Verse 26. For then shall thou have the, thy delight in the Almighty, and the shaft, and shall lift up thy face unto God. Verse 27. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto Him, and He shall hear you. He shall hear you. What are these two conditions? You ever felt like God doesn't hear your prayers? What are the two conditions? According to what I just read to you, having the Word of God, reading the Word of God and having it in your heart and having a clean, a clean life. Then thou shalt make a prayer unto Him and He shall hear you and you shall pay your vows. That's talking about faithfulness financially. That's talking about paying your vows, being a faithful person. Verse 28. So three things right there qualify us. Three things right there qualify us. Number one, we've got to have God's Word in our heart, get sick, sin out of our lives, and be faithful. Be faithful to God. Verse 28. Thou shalt also, here it is, decree a thing. Everybody say decree. decree. And it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon your ways. So if you do those three things, if you put the word of God in your heart, speak it out of your mouth, understand that it is your sword, it is your offensive weapon, get sin out of your life, be faithful, not a rebel, but faithful to the God-given authority and leadership in your life. If you do those three things, according to verse 28, you shall be able to decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. 
I don't think you understand what a decree is, how powerful a decree is. This was written back in the days when they had kings and majesties and magistrates and all of those things. And today a, a president will pass something into law and Congress has to approve it. Or he can do it by executive order, which is basically a modern day decree. And we have such a government that somebody that doesn't like that can come along and undo that. But back in the biblical days, when a king would decree something, honey, it was law. That's why in the days of Ezra, when they went out and they started building, rebuilding the temple, and after King Darius and King Cyrus had, uh, had, you know, after King Darius had passed on, Cyrus said, passed on. And the next king said, stop it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to allow you to do this. They went down to the courthouse, so to speak. And they got the original decree. And that decree was from a couple kings before them, King Darius, that said, listen, these Jews are going to be able to build this temple. And nothing's going to stop them. They're going to be able to rebuild their altar, their wall. I decree it today. I just studied this last week. I decree it today. And you know what? This is an eternal decree. See, put that little amendment in there. Put that little clause in there that says this is an eternal decree, which means it will never be undone. <laughs> and furthermore, since you're reading this and reopening this, you ain't going to like this, but you got to pay for it. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! They wish they had never opened that thing up again and just let them Jews build it themselves on their own dime. But while they were reading it, they said, by the way, we got to pay for it. Oh, isn't that nice? And guess what? Even though the sitting king was against it, he had to honor it because a previous king had decreed it. So what does this have to do with me? I'm not a king or a priest. Yes, you are. The Bible says if you're in Christ, you are kings and priests unto God. <laughs> that means when you speak, all heaven backs it. Mm -hmm. That means when you dec decree it and declare it, all heaven backs it. Hallelujah. That's right. When you speak it, heaven has to back it. Now that doesn't mean that I can go out here and I can decree that the Tennessee Vols are going to go 14-0 uh, and 0 and win the national championship as much as I would love that. Amen. 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 <laughs> I knew I'd get an amen out of some of you. What that means is this. It means as long as I decree according to the word of God, according to what God has spoken, because he is the ultimate king, reminds you this, that the Bible says that we are kings and priests unto God. Little K, little kings. But the Bible says that he is the king, capital K, king of kings and lord of lords. We're kings, but he's the senior king. We're lords, but he's the senior lord. Hallelujah. But if we take his word, that he has given to us that authority and that dominion and we begin to speak it out of our mouth and when we decree it it has to come to pass what does that mean that when you decree over your body that by your by the stripes of jesus i am healed that body has got to line up amen when you decree over your mind that i don't suffer with depression and oppression i have the mind of christ god has not given me the spirit of fear but a power in a sound mind that my mind has to line up. Can I get an amen? When I decree into the atmosphere that my business must prosper, when I decree that I, I am blessed going in and blessed coming out, that every need I have shall supply according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus, that I'm the head and I'm not the tail, and I take the Word of God and decree it out of my mouth, out of my lips, all of heaven will back it, God will bring it to pass, because the Bible says that He looks to and fro over all the earth looking to and fro seeing where he can perform his word. Do you know that this morning? God is looking for somebody that has the guts, the courage, and the faith to stand up and decree his word and he'll perform it. It's kind of like a volleyball game. You remember playing volleyball? What would you do with that ball? You kind of bump and set it. And you set it, right? So that the big dog could come in, the spiker, the jumper, and come in and spike it home. That's what God's asking. He's saying, set me up. I'm ready to spike something. Set me up. I'm ready to jump high. I'm ready to spike it in your life. Because God loves to show up, show off, and show out. Yes. That's right. He loves it. So how do we set God up? You decree his word. You stand in the midst of the battle. You don't retreat. You're going to get slaughtered. Stand strong. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord come to pass. Set your face like flint against the wind. Watch him deliver you. And what do you do in the midst of circumstances when you can't see because of the opposition? When you can't see nothing, when you can't hear nothing, when it feels like you're going under, you stand. How do you stand? You pull out, you stand under that shield of faith. 
You stand under all that armor, that artillery, armor that you have on. But then you pull out, don't forget your sword. Don't forget your sword. Your part is to decree that word. Your part is to let it go because there's an assignment on it. The devil hates it when you use the word of God. Jesus is our example when he was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. What did he do? Well, the devil came and tempted him and said, if you are the son of God, then this. If you are the son of God, do this. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And he said, every time, he said, Satan, it is written. Now, he was Jesus. He could have just said it. He was the son of God. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. And the Bible says the devil left him. Try to come back at a more opportune time. What weakens the forces of darkness in your life more than anything is the word of God. But if you don't know it, if you don't meditate on it, if you don't put it in your spirit and deliver it out of your mouth, it's useless. And we're sitting in the corner getting our brains beat out by the enemy with our back to the enemy. Just, oh, don't do it, don't do it. God, where are you? God, where are you? And God says, hey, I gave you armor. I gave you, uh, I gave you uh, the weapons of your warfare. I don't know how to use them. Well, maybe if you come to church more than once a month, you would learn and be trained in how to use them by that little bald-headed drill sergeant down there. And yeah, he wants to train you. <laughs> well, God, I, yeah, I need you to do something. God says, well, I, I did it all at the cross. I need you to get up and, and do what I told you to do. I love to use the example of Barney Fife, Mayberry. You know, Andy deputizes Barney. And Barney's really excited because he's got the badge, he's got the gun, and the bullet. The bullet. One bullet. And he's twirling that gun, walking down through them streets, feeling pretty good about himself. And don't we do that? Amen? We get saved, we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. And all of a sudden, he happens to be walking along, and he looks into the local mercantile, and he sees the place getting robbed. And he's like, oh, golly! Andy, I've got to call Andy. I've got to tell Andy about this. So he runs down to the local payphone. You know, he's on an uh, 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 officer's salary, so he has to bum a quarter. I borrow a quarter. He dials Andy because they didn't have cell phones or pagers back then. So he dials up. He says, Andy, Andy, you got to get down here. The local mercantile's getting robbed. And he's like, man, I am too far away. Barney, would you go in there and make the arrest? Oh, Andy, I can't. I can't. I'm afraid. And he says, Barney, you have the authority to do it because I gave you and deputized you. You've got my authority to get in there and do it. All right, I'll do it, Andy. So he goes in there. He says, stop in the name of the law. And they look at him. And they see the badge. And they see the uniform. And they see the weapons. And they back up a little bit. And they say, well, you, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? Like the seven sons of Sceva. You know what he does? Well, I'm deputized by Andy. Get out of my way. Go warm my car up, would you? So you know what? They get off with the money. What should he have done? Well, he did the right thing by stepping up in his authority. I got the believer's authority. Huh? Christ is in me. He put all things under my feet. Okay, all right. But the difference is this. He never pulled out his weapon to enforce that authority. The devil don't care that you and I have authority. He'll still push you around. They don't care. He could care less. But you've got to pull that weapon out to enforce that authority. Yes. And the only weapon we've been given that's not defensive but offensive is the Word of God. Amen. 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 You apply that Word of God in situations in your life, you see heaven move. You see that mountain moved into the sea. Because remember in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus said, he said three times, say, say, say. Say, say, say. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We, listen, do we see it in the scriptures? Absolutely. Elijah walked into the kingdom of Jezebel and Ahab, and he said, it is not going to rain for a period of time. We see it in the scriptures. Jesus came up. Uh, what did Jesus do? Jesus came to a withered tree, a withered fig tree, and what did he say? He cursed it because it would not produce fruit. The next day they came by and that tree was still cursed. I'm telling you, those were examples. Those were examples. Huh? We also see it in the scriptures because in Romans chapter 4, 16 through 22, 21, for the sake of reference, read it yourself. But I do want to get to the part where Abraham was the greatest example of this as of all people. Because let me just paraphrase the story for you. And I want you to go home and meditate on this. Because Abraham, God came to him and said, Abe and Sarah, I'm going to give you a baby. You're going to have a baby. 
at your age. You're going to have a wonderful baby. It's going to be great. A big, beautiful baby. A big, beautiful baby. And you know what he said? I can't do it. I'm too old. Well, God gave him the faith to believe it. That's what took that process so long, in my opinion, is because Abraham had to have his faith to believe it. Because a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways, the Bible says. And if one day I'm believing God and the next day I'm not, I'm deferring, what I'm deterring and, and holding back what God wants to do in my life. You want to know what really moves God and pleases Him and turns the Holy Ghost on is your faith. When you stand up in the midst of a storm, in the midst of opposition, and you make a proclamation, you make a decree to state that I shall live and I shall not die. That I am blessed of God. That I'm not going under according to the word of God. Amen. 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 When you stand up and you do that in the midst of opposition, in the midst of the storm, there's the Lord again looking for that volleyball. <laughs> there it is. There's somebody ready and willing. There's somebody standing on my word. There's somebody right there. There's somebody ready. I'm ready to perform my word. Jesus is a performer. Jesus Christ superstar. Not the way you think or the way Hollywood portrayed him, but he is a superstar. And he's ready to show up, show off, and show out in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Somebody needs this today real bad. So in Romans chapter 4, maybe it's me. In Romans chapter 4, Abraham, Abraham, the Bible says, changed some things. He believed God and did not waver for the most part. He did in the beginning. But in the end, he did not waver. And he changed his name from Abram which, to Abraham, which means father of many nations. And the Bible says this, verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed. Even God who quicketh the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. There's the key right there. Because otherwise it's a lie. It is a lie for me to stand up and tell you I'm healed when there's sickness in my body. It's a lie for me to stand up and tell you I'm blessed when, I, when you may be dead broke. It is a lie to stand up and say I'm not struggling with oppression and depression when I'm, I'm just down in the dumps. It's a lie to do that. However, unless God spoke it, unless God decreed it, because God is not a man that he should lie. His word and his decree trumps everything. That's right. It trumps your circumstances. It trumps your situation. Huh? So here's what you do. You stand up and you say, according to the word of God, I'm blessed. According to the word of God, I'm healed. According to the word of God, I'm doing great because I am happy and full of joy. The word of God declares that I'm blessed. I don't care what my circumstances look like. The word of God declares that I'm healthy. I don't care what the doctor's report says. The word of God declares that I have the mind of Christ and I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I don't care how I feel on the inside. The word of God declares it. I believe it and I decree it and watch God move in your circumstance and change the situation. Come on and put your hands together one more time and magnify the Lord. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. What does praise have to do with that? We know that praise is a powerful two-edged sword, isn't it too? The Bible says that praise and worship is actually a weapon of our warfare. It binds up kings and puts them in chains and fetters, right? Well, why is, what does that have to do with faith? What does that have to do with what you're speaking here, Pastor? Listen. Listen to what comes out of your mouth when you're praising God. Huh? You are my deliverer. You are my healer. I, I praise you, God. I worship you, God. It, there's no greater faith than to give God the widow's might, which means there's nothing you have left. You don't feel like doing it. All hell's breaking loose on your life and circumstances are trying to attack you. But what you do is you take the little bit you have, which is the fruit of your lips. I, I might not have a dime to rub together. I might not have the strength because you may be going through something in your body that you're battling. You might not even feel like being here. You would have just rather stayed under the covers today because of the oppression and depression you're battling. But listen, when you come into the presence of God and you lift up and give Him the ounce of what you have, all it takes is a little mustard, uh, faith as a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, but the greatest of all trees. And when you give God the little bit that you have, God says, that's faith. That's faith. You're like that woman with the issue of blood who got out of her bed where there was comfort. The only comfort she knew was in that bed. 
But she said, if I can get down into the street, if I can get down into the place where he's at, if I'm even if I've got to crawl to him, I'm going to get to him today and I'm going to release my faith on the hem of his garment. And I know that that garment, hallelujah, it's not the garment that heals me. It's not... Uh, it's not my crawling that's healed me, but I know that it is my faith released into him that moves the heart of God. And virtue came out of Jesus and healed that woman. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. When you don't have it to give, but you give it anyways, that's faith, honey. That's faith. And that moves the hand of God in your life. And finally, in closing, I'm going to share this with you this morning. How much does a prayer weigh? Well, let's put it in modern terms. How much does your words weigh? How much does a prayer weigh? There is a story of a grocery store owner who tried to weigh one. What did he try to weigh? A prayer. A tired-looking woman came into the store and asked for enough food to make dinner for her children. The grocer asked her how much she could spend. The frail woman answered, I have nothing to offer but a little prayer. The storekeeper was not very sentimental nor religious. So he said half mockingly, write it on paper and I'll weigh it. <laughs> so she did. The grocer placed the paper on the weight side of the old fashioned scales. Then he began piling food on the other side. But to his amazement, the scale would not go down. He finally became flustered and gave the woman a large bag of food. The grocer never saw the woman again. But he treasures the slip of paper upon which the woman's prayer had been written to this day. Here's what was written on that paper when he opened it up. Please, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You may stand to your feet this morning.